In this video today, I am going to talk to you a little bit about the importance of loose parts and Play-Doh to aid child-led learning and child-led play. Now, before I talk about the kind of resources that you can use and why they are so important, um, oh, it's very bright today. <laughs> Come a bit closer to the screen. Um, I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about what child-led learning actually means um, child led play and um, how you can make sure that you are offering those kinds of opportunities in your environment, in your learning environment, within your setting or at home. Um, I'm, also, I'm also going to explain a little bit about what it means because I think it's one of those terms that you might see a lot or hear about a lot um, but don't necessarily understand um, what that looks like in real life. So when we talk about the learning or the learning process or the environment being very child-led and focusing on independent play, what we actually mean is um, the child has the opportunity to choose their learning, to choose their activities, to choose their play independently. So you're looking at an environment that has resources set out for children to choose to use themselves, and they can do this um, following their own interests. So if you have a range of resources that are very open-ended and can be used in lots of different ways where the child can use their imagination, this means that they can choose things that suit their needs, suit their interests at that time, and they're going to be much more engaged in their learning and in their play. And remember, um, for all children, play is learning. So when I talk about child-led learning and I talk about child-led play, I essentially mean the same thing, really. Um, so just to try and put this into context um, of, of us as adults, try to imagine that you have been invited on, um, on a, a day where you're going to go to a lecture hall and they're going to, the lecturer is going to try and teach you about something in particular. Um, so um, think about going there and you're sat down, you're sat down in rows in the lecture hall and you've got a lecturer at the front who's maybe got a big screen on behind them. Um, you might have some handouts to look at and they are going to be talking about beer. Okay. Um, now, are you going to learn more about beer and how beer is made, um, the differences between different types of beer by just sitting and listening to this lecturer talking to you about beer, maybe showing you a few diagrams on the screen behind them, um, a few different chemical processes on your handout, um, and you're just going to sit there for a good half an hour, let's say, maybe even an hour, whilst you try and retain that information and then go away and remember it. Um, or are you going to learn more if you turn up to that lecture hall and the lecturer or the teacher um, who's teaching you um, has some different tables set out with different activities and one of those activities is beer tasting. OK, something a little bit more active, hands on, there's some resources. It's going to kind of tap into different sensory elements. So you're not just using your ears to listen um, to what somebody is telling you and learning that way. You're not just like looking at things on a screen. You're actually going to maybe get to taste something, get to feel something, get to investigate something in different ways. Um, you're probably going to remember more about that lesson than you are if you were just sat back passively listening to them um, in a lecture hall. Um, but here's the thing with it being tailored to your interests. Let's say you got there that day and you absolutely hate beer, okay? The, the smell of it, the sight of it, it, it makes you feel quite unwell and there you are being sat in front of this activity that you have absolutely no interest in um, and not only do you not have any interest in it you actually find it quite upsetting being in a situation where you're having to learn about something like that now yes you may remember that lesson but you'll 
gonna probably remember it for the wrong reasons because one of the things we know about memory is that you are more likely to remember something if you ha either have a lot of fun doing it, you find it really interesting and really exciting and it kind of uses those emotions and it taps into that sort of part of your brain or if you find an event really quite upsetting and traumatic, unfortunately, you do tend to remember those kind of situations as well. So let's say you really, really hate beer and the lecturer, the teacher comes up to you and notices that you're a little bit upset in this scenario. Maybe this isn't um, tailored to your interests and finds out what kind of things do you like to drink? and they decide, or they realise that actually you really like gin. So the next day you come to that lecture hall and there's a different activity on a table which is a gin tasting activity and there's lots of different um, fruits and resources and items that you might actually put into gin to change the taste or make it look different. And all of a sudden, your interest level in that lesson has gone way up. And you're going to go home at the end of that day, you're going to feel really excited, um, really stimulated about learning, and um, you're probably going to remember a little bit more than you would have done if it was beer tasting, which wasn't in your interest, or if you were just sat back in that lecture hall being told to remember something. Um, and that's what we mean about tailoring um, things to a child's interest and things being topics or themes that you do introduce being child-led. Now being truly child-led um, is making sure that your environment where the children are able to choose their learning and choose their play is set out in a way that's at child height, at their level, where they can be truly independent without the help of an adult. Um, so they can look around the room and they can have a look at the kind of resources that they might want to use and decide for themselves what they're going to do. Decide for themselves what they're going to make, what they're going to investigate, extend their own learning by adding in bits and pieces from elsewhere and, and having the permission to do that as well. It's really important that if you do have um, an open plan environment where you might have certain resources in one area and certain things on one shelf, that children are allowed to mix and combine things from different places um, in order to extend their ideas and make things um, a little bit more on their interest level and challenge themselves further. Um, that's not to say that you, you're going to allow children to completely run riot and, and make an area um, utter chaos if you have a system in place where children know where things go and as long as things can be put back at the end of the session and they know where they belong then that's not going to be an issue um, but it's really important that they are allowed to explore different resources um, to suit their own ideas. And this is where Loose Parts and also Play-Doh really comes into it. Um, now lots of you know or maybe you don't know that I own an online shop called Child Led Play um, where I sell homemade Play-Doh, loose parts, natural items and also themed play sets as well. Um, and one of the reasons that I really, really love to use Play-Doh within play that I like to offer it to my children to choose um, and I like to include it in most of my play sets that I offer on my shop website as well is because it's so open-ended and it suits so many different ages as well so you know it, it, you're not just offering children a resource where they can go through the process of play and then there's one outcome at the end of it. Play-Doh is differentiated by outcome. You know, you may have a very young child who enjoys just the feel of this, you know, the sensory element of squishing the Play-Doh, of using their fingers and their hands to make different marks, to work those muscles in their hands and really explore the dough on a sensory level. An older child may challenge themselves further by um, making different shapes 
and combining those shapes to make a, a bigger overall model of something. Um, but even if they don't have an outcome at the end of that, that doesn't matter because they are still learning by going through that process of using the Play-Doh. And it's nice to have different colours on offer as well because then they can choose colours for a purpose. Um, and, and also, I, I mean, I know this is a bit of a contentious issue for a lot of adults, but letting children mix their Play-Doh it's a really important tool for learning because they are able to investigate what happens when you mix different colours, um, they're able to add more of one colour, more of another, change that process without, you know, like when you're, when you're mixing paint, you can mix paints together and then paint, but you get to a point where you paint, like, put too much on it rips the paper you can only go so far whereas with play-doh you can keep mixing other bits in and yes if at the end of it all you end up with a murky brown color that's fine this is still a process that children are learning and that they're going through and they've discovered something um, and they can still play with that play-doh in lots of different ways just using the colour that they've made. Um, so this is why Play-Doh is so good because not only does it help build up the muscles in your hands and your fingers ready for writing later on and, and also if you've got a big like heavy amount of Play-Doh for little ones it's going to be building up those arm muscles, those chest muscles. Um, this is where things like a dojim, if you've heard of dojim, comes into it where you do certain exercises with dough. Um, I used to like doing this with my reception class in the morning we put on a fun bit of music and we do um, little movements along to the music so maybe we do some squishing with our pincer the grip fingers to the beat or poking or we get a big piece and we'd squish it really hard with two hands we'd squish it with one hand um, or we challenge ourselves by putting the dough on top of our hands with your arm outstretched can you lift it up and down how many times can you do that and they would feel how that would maybe make their arms ache a little bit um how big a piece of play-doh can you lift up um you know building on those bigger muscles those gross motor skills that are then going to tie into um fine motor control later on and then eventually being able to pick up a pencil correctly and hold it and get used to writing later on but you really mustn't skip that step of gross and fine motor play um, before you try and put a pencil in a child's hand and expect them to write. So it has lots of physical um, benefits by having that on offer. And the lovely thing about Play-Doh is that you can combine it with so many different things. So not just having Play-Doh on its own and colour mixing Play-Doh on its own. Um, you can combine it with loose parts to create so many different things. Um, you can use it with different shape cutters, things like Numicon. It's great for math ma mathematics, um, pushing the Numicon into the play-doh and making those shapes and helping children to count with one-to-one -one correspondence by squishing the holes as they count so they can see where they've already counted so they don't count those once again and they can you know find the correct number at the end of it um making different shapes with different cutters and um, different letter cutters that you can get now as well. Um, I'm going to link to some of those at the bottom of this video. Um, loose parts that are there for making patterns. Um, one of the things that are really popular to use with Play-Doh that I sell in my shop are the chickpea pearls that we have um, and you can use them to make different patterns in the play-doh. Children love it with imaginative play, um, making cupcakes, making pizzas, putting different toppings on top. Um, they can take this learning in so many different directions, so many different ways depending on what they are interested in. So using the same Play-Doh and the same loose parts and different resources, my children have made pizzas, they've made cakes, they've made Easter eggs and decorated them, um, they've made monsters, um, they've made mermaids, they, they're so many different 
ways that you can use it and you'll find that children will use it depending on what their interest is in that moment what they're playing what they're interested in um the idea that they're running with throughout their play and it just helps them to extend their learning and um continue to challenge themselves and combine resources in a way that helps them to use their imagination and really take their learning in the direction that they want to as well. Now some children do need a little bit of scaffolding, a little bit of help with regards to um, how to use certain, re certain resources. Um, perhaps they may not have a specific idea in mind and they're not really sure what they want to do within the process or how they want to create something. And that's okay because not every child will look at um, open-ended resources and, and have an idea of what they want to do. Sometimes they just need a little bit of modelling from an adult or to watch a friend and see what they're doing. Or maybe they just need a little bit of a loose theme around those resources. Um, and this is where the themed Play-Doh sets that I make comes into it. So some of the things that I've made in the past are a Mermaid Lagoon set, um, Under the Sea set, a honeybee set where it's got resources, natural resources, um, play-doh, loose parts, different things are, that are around that theme that children can use in different ways in a in a loose way but it just kind of scaffolds them and gives them a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a starting point. Um, if your child is given a themed play set and they don't use it in the way that you are expecting them to, that's fine. That does not mean that your play activity has failed. As long as your child has explored it in some way or another, and maybe they've gone off on a completely different tangent and you've given them a honeybee set and they've made a monster. It doesn't matter. What they've done there is they've taken that learning in the direction that they've chosen. So they have found something that they want to play with, but maybe not within the way that you expected. Um, they've changed it to suit their own needs and their own interests, they are still going through that process of play and learning. So that is not a fail, that's actually a big fat positive. Um, so don't ever look at um, a play activity that's gone off on a tangent and think, oh, that's gone wrong. That's actually still been a really worthwhile um, activity um, and not, not a failure at all. Um, so, and, and this is the lovely thing about child-led learning. Children will always um, have different ways that they want to do things. They will always have their own ideas and by offering them resources that can be used in lots of different ways and then reused again, like Play-Doh, you know, you don't just um, play with it, make something and then it's done. You can squish it back all together again, you can remould it, you can start all over again and maybe if your child has a particular interest and they've really enjoyed um, achieving something and making something with their play-doh that they want to squish it all and do it again, that's absolutely fine. At, at Christmas for example my three-year-old um, wanted to make a snowman with some of the snow play-doh and when she'd done it she was so happy, she was so excited but still so interested in it that she wanted to do it again and each time she did it, and she did it about five different times, each time she did it she added to it, she got a little bit better at it, or she changed it in a, in a different way and, and that is where the progress in play and the progress in learning really is. This is where you can actually see progress happening when children have the freedom to play with open-ended resources themselves and continue to play within their interests. Um, so always try to make sure that you are allowing children that time and that space to continue to go back to an activity. So just because it looks like they've finished something doesn't mean that that's it and they've finished and it's time to put it away and start something else. Try to leave something out for a little bit longer. Um, so that they have that chance to come back and maybe challenge themselves further, add to an activity and um, get a little bit more out of it. And you will find that children, when they're given that space and that freedom to be truly child-led um, and child-initiated, 
they may surprise you with how much they actually choose to do themselves.